Welcome everybody to the Fall 2020 Lineman Associates Capital Market Webinar presented by Lineman Associates and Real Estate Financial Modeling. This is your host, Bruce Kirsch, founder and CEO of REFM, provider of financial analysis tools and training to the commercial real estate business since 2009. We're doing a little bit of a different delivery this time we had some complications with respect to scheduling so what we're going to do now is record this and we'll provide this recording to everybody uh, on the same date that the webinar was supposed to take place and we're going to do a little bit of a different format this time peter we're going to have a conversation between the two of us and for those of us for those of you who do not know peter lineman he's um, dr peter lineman founder of lineman associates and Lineman Associates is a strategic and investment analysis advisory firm headquartered in Philadelphia. So welcome, Peter. Uh, well, thank you for doing this with me, Bruce. And uh, I look forward to the session. I mean, we always have fun, and I, I think that this will be fun to do a kind of a, um, fireside between us uh, rather than me just uh, carrying forth. Okay, that sounds great. So, gosh, there's a lot to talk about right now. A lot of interesting topics. Um, the uh, famous curse, I think the famous Chinese curse is may you live in interesting times. And uh, here we are in November of 2020 in some very interesting times. We have had an election. However, votes are still being tallied in some jurisdictions. What is your general post-election outlook. What What is your gut? You've seen quite a few of these at this point, and uh, what, is your, what does your gut tell you in terms of how things are going to play out? I'm not a political maven, but here's my gut. Um, and the only wild card in this is there were so many mail ballots this time beyond any past history is, is that it's a bit of a wild card to it. Um, I would say that um, Biden, President-elect Biden, uh, appears to have won um, that if the president or any office holder believes that there were improprieties with the election process, the state laws in each state specify how those are to be reviewed and reacted to. And I would hope that uh, those are done fully and thoroughly to everyone's legal satisfaction. Um, some people have said to me, oh, it's terrible that they're a appealing. And I said, it's really, it's, it's a little like if you, Bruce, you and I, if I make a loan to you and then you subsequently go into bankruptcy and stop paying me, that's your right, right? It's not like you're exercising something that's not your right. You have, from the moment you signed the loan with me, the right under the law of the land to use bankruptcy to try to protect your asset. And there's a whole procedure set up to deal with that, right? And in right. an odd way, it, it same is true of election. It's not just you have the right to get votes, but there's a whole mechanism. I'm certainly not an expert in it on uh, figuring it out from there. Um, so, I, but based on in the past, absent a real smoking gun, I, I don't think it changes the outcome. So, and we haven't had a lot of smoking guns in history, right? So um, I would suspect the exercise, the, the outcome holds. As you know, there were uh, uh, some seats picked up by the Republicans in the House. And then you're left with the Senate and as we sit here, Alaska, I don't get, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but I'm not, Bruce, which is there's only like eight people live in Alaska, and I can't figure out how Alaska is still counting votes. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I was thinking you know, that too. I, I was just wondering, I was like, what's the, what's the holdup in Alaska? I, I don't get it. I'm not an expert, but if it were California or New York or, you know, a big state, you kind of go, hey, there's a lot of votes, right? But I have a little, I don't understand Alaska. It would appear that North Carolina on January 5th will be the key to the Senate with two seats 
that after the first round, the Republicans held. And the people I read who are kind of mavens, if there are any mavens left in predicting outcomes, would suggest that the Republicans would carry at least one and probably both of those seats. And my only comment is I feel sorry for the people in Georgia. Uh, when you realize that uh, I think the Democrats spent $109 million in South Carolina contesting Lindsey Graham's seat. I think he spent $4 million or so. That means that for the last six, seven weeks, people in South Carolina or in Pennsylvania where I live, we haven't seen advertisements for Target or for Walmart or for automobiles or tires or Coca-Cola or any product other than political because, you know, there was so much money chasing, right, in those handful of states. And, and uh, think about, Bruce, about Georgia. If they were spending, let's just say, a combined $115 million in South Carolina for one seat, you've got two seats up on the same day that determine the swing of the Senate. You want to bet on like Five hundred million being spent by the two parties, right? Which means the residents of Georgia, from basically uh, what uh, Thanksgiving to January fifth, are not going to see anything on YouTube or television or radio or whatever that's not a political ad. They're going to outbid. Co- you know those lovely Coca-Cola. Uh, Christmas where the polar bears, you know, the mother and the baby polar, they're not going to get to see those commercials this year. They're going to get, they're going to get outbid by politicals. So it's going to get to January 6th and the people in Georgia are going to find out Walmart and Target and tires and automobiles and beers still exist um, as something that's advertised. So I feel sorry for the people uh, getting uh, inundated in that state or until January 5th. It does look, though, that you'll probably come out with a Republican Senate, a little bit less Democratic House and a Democratic president. That would probably mean singles and doubles, right? Singles and doubles. You're not going to get major tax overhauls. You're not going to get seats added to the Supreme Court. You're not going to get... but. The, you know, we've had a lot of these divided governments. I actually kind of like them personally, but that's neither here nor there. You'll get a lot of singles and doubles. And if you said there's any good news in it, Biden spent his lifetime in those chambers cutting deals, or right. most of his lifetime cutting deals. Now, probably most of the people he cut deals with are kind of gone, but still. He, he he at least knows what it's like to cut a deal. He's saying all the right things about unifying, but anybody who thinks that this was a unifying election, I don't know what they're smoking. Um, right. it, I mean, I had somebody say to me, oh, yeah, this will all be unified now. And I said, what, you expect QAnon and the KKK and Bernie Sanders and Antifa are going to get together for s'mores and right. hot cocoa and right. sing Kumbaya. I mean, that's not going to happen, unfortunately. So it'll still be divisive. And um, uh, and COVID will still be here. And we're getting, as you know, we're heading into probably the worst stretch of it with people and the holidays and indoors and it's cold and all this. So I'm, it's going to be a grim next couple of months from a COVID point of view. The good news obviously is um, you, you had Pfizer and you're going to have two or three more, I suspect by the end of the month or the first week of next month, who are also going to have similar announcements. Um, And so, you know, help is on the way and what you want to make sure as an individual, it feels in a funny way like, um, you know, sort of the beginning of 1945 or late 1944 in World War II, where the end was in sight, but still a long way away. 
right. you don't want to die on the last day of the war. And yet there's still a lot of carnage, both human, health-wise human, and economic carnage that's going to occur before the war is over here. Yeah. A couple of reactions to your comments. One is with respect to the uh, barrage of political ads. I happen to be in Georgia, so you're, you're spot on. And hopefully the plus side of that is we're going to be so deluged with these ads that people are going to go to the polls and say, I don't want to deal with this again in four years. You know, <laughs> actually drive a better turnout than the, than the general. Um, and we'd be over and done with it in a, in a convincing way, you know? Um, yep. That's one thing. The other is we happen to be recording this on Veterans Day. And I read this morning uh, in the Washington Post just a little sort of feel good article um, about um, an Army veteran whose father was um, on, um, you know, Utah Beach. And he wrote, uh, he was a survivor of that campaign. And he wrote his son a letter when his son, who's the author of the article, was four months old. And, you know, he found a typewriter in the battlefield, basically. You know, it took some yep. time. Um, and it's very touching. But the the takeaway is, um, you know, his opening line is, this is not going to last forever. And I think people need to keep that in mind as well, is we're, we're, we're coming into this you know, cold and flu season in in a real serious way uh, in the next handful of weeks. And I heard and saw articles that heat lamps, you know, the heat lamps you see on the, the sidewalks for restaurants, those are basically sold out because people are preparing to sit outside on their patios and their decks all winter. They want to have some semblance of a social life. You know, they got to do it outside. Yep. It's... Yep. It's going to be it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. We did have a good. Um, I, as you know, I was very concerned about social unrest, riots, looting, and so forth related to the election. And at least to this point, it has not happened. And I think that's terrific news in general, and certainly great news for cities, uh, because had there been massive looting or if there still were to occur massive looting in the cities and damage in the cities and so forth it would set the cities would have set the cities back three years four years of um and and they've got enough to come back from with covid and the er right. earlier episodes right yeah i saw the pictures of landlords building, you know, the plywood barriers in front of their beautiful glass lobbies. And so thank God it hasn't come to that. I don't know how long they're planning on keeping them up, but um, yeah, luckily so far. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. In, in Lineman Letter, on the cover of the Lineman, Lineman Letter, which for those of you who don't know, it's a quarterly publication from Lineman Associates, Phenomenal Market Insights and Research. Uh, you pay homage to the Impressionist painters. And in particular, I think you mentioned the Pointillist painters. And yep. you, you say one of the things that you do as an economist and as an observer of, of the world is you look at the pattern, you look at the dots out there, and you make your interpretation, your assessment of how do these dots cluster, which ones are the impactful ones, What's important to see? Do I see a pattern here or do, is it just noise? Let's talk about your idea for a moment of this, what you're calling a butterfly recovery. What, where do you sure. see that currently? Sure. So the, 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 just to go one step further on um, the point about art is if you've ever looked at pointillist, if you get really close, you don't see anything except dots. Right? right. But if you move back or as you move back, the picture comes into focus. Right? right. And 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 I think what happens to most people, um, including a lot of trained economists, they get too close to the picture to see anything other than the dots. So they they really see the dot, but they don't see the picture. And. 
if I have any skill in this regard, I think it's being able to collect all types of dots, official government data with all its limitations, um, unofficial government data. And as you know, one of the things I do when I meet people or talk to people is say, well, how's business? And they think I'm just being maybe kind. I'm not. I actually care. And I'm trying to put together two more dots, you know, right. in the whole thing. Um, I've said that my reading, this was not a typical cyclical recession. This wasn't the result of the usual excesses and so forth. This was very simply, uh, that doesn't mean there weren't little excesses sitting around or companies that were weak. There are always companies that are weak. There are always companies that are in trouble. And obviously, if you were a weak and in trouble company and things go really bad, you're in particular trouble. But this was caused by two things, One, both related to COVID. One was governments around the world, state, local, and federal, including in this country, told us that even if you're willing to do things, you're not allowed to do them, right? You're not allowed to do them. And, you know, the list was long, right? You couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't go to a movie theater. Um, and, and, and if you were in China, you couldn't even leave your apartment for a while, right? So, so the first cause was the government wouldn't allow us even if we were willing to. And the second factor that was happening at the same time to differing degrees and across the world, including the United States, was, oh, I'm allowed to do it, but I'm not sure I want to do it. So you've been allowed to fly around the U.S. for, you know, but I haven't flown around the U.S. and I'm a huge traveler, right? And I haven't flown around the U.S. I've been allowed to go to hotels. I haven't gone to a lot of hotels. I've been allowed to... Um, have people into my apartment. We haven't had people into our apartment. So I'm just using those as examples. When this recovery is full is when those two factors have fully receded here and abroad. And I say here and abroad because abroad affects, let's just think of foreign travel, tourists coming here can't come from um, uh, Canada because they won't let you. And there's people who don't want to anyway, right? And so when those two have receded, then you'll be back to something like a normal economy. I don't see that happening soon. And it will happen in fits and starts. And the reason I use the butterfly is butterflies don't fly fast. They don't fly in straight lines. They sometimes go backwards. They sometimes stop. They sometimes go left and right, but they tend to go forward. And if you think of the two factors, Bruce, that I'm saying are causing this, which is governments here and around the world, state, local, and federal, here and around the world saying, no, you can't. In Philadelphia today, they reversed their view that they were going to have children come back to school physically in the city of Philadelphia. Well, that's the butterfly taking a step back. And you say, why? Because there were going to be some janitors, right? There were going to be some people that supply uh, supplies to the school, et cetera, et cetera, that were going to move forward that just got moved backwards. Right. Um, and so it's going to come in fits and starts. And at the same time, we were talking about how coming forward, my wife and I were just talking. We've been going to the gym. There are not a lot of people there. It's a big, big gym. You wipe everything down. They have great filtration. You're not near anybody. But we've been talking about, given what's coming, do we want to go to the gym for the next couple of months? And that's me slowing the economy down. I'm allowed to go. Yeah. Those two things are what create the butterfly. And I said to someone, if you want to know, forget all the data data. If I had to give you one metric to know how the economy is really recovered, um, watch NFL stadiums, watch NBA stadiums, watch, you know, when they are full per normal, it means that the government has said you're free to go if you want to and fill a stadium, and we feel comfortable to do so and fill a stadium. 
And I only say the sport because it's so easy. All you have to do is turn on your TV. You don't have to even be interested in the game. And you turn on the game and you know what it's like right now. Some of the stadiums have nobody because they're not allowed. Some have some. Some have a bit more. Nobody has a lot. I don't know if the Eagles said you can have a sellout crowd if you want. I don't think they'd sell out, even if they were allowed to at this point. So that's why I call it a butterfly recovery. It's going to be slow. The advance in vaccines are going to help a lot. Advance in treatments are going to help a lot because if you get death off the table, that's why I think it's a butterfly. And I'm getting data every day that points, dots, right? And right. you get two dots saying, oh, we move forward. And one dot saying, oh, we move back. And one saying we stopped. And one saying we move sideways. And then the next day we hit repeat. So we've come a long way from the bottom, which was probably late May. We've come a long way. But all you have to do is look at airports, right? You look at subways, look at number of people going to office buildings, look at the traffic and shopping centers, uh, look at the tourist activity. Um, you know we got a long way to go. Absolutely. It's funny that what are the things that people are talking about in hushed tones nowadays, right? What do, what do we say in hushed tones? Oh, he traveled or he yeah. goes to the gym or they, you know, they, they just go back to the gym. It's, it's like kind of you're funny. like you're in a, like you're Edmund Hillary, right? Or Amundsen, you know, exploring the poles or Everest or something, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we're, we're just in a completely different realm right now. And along those lines, in terms of deal flow has been down, right? There's just so much. Uncertainty. Huge, huge down. A little bit holding on in, in industrial properties, a little bit holding on in, off, in uh, apartments. Right. Pretty much gone in office, pretty much gone in retail, pretty much gone in hotel, pretty much gone in senior. Um, there aren't really loans to be had, new loans to be had for office or senior or retail. I mean, obviously, I guess if you had a, a, a Walmart build a suit, there's probably money available for that, right? But in general, if you were doing a build a suit for uh, um, uh, Amazon or somebody, right? Mm -hmm. There's money, but I'm talking about the normal office, the normal uh, hotel. There, there are no loans, and there's not even much equity, and the equity did, wants pretty high returns. So there's not much transaction there. On the other hand, banks are forbearing, right? They they have unlimited reserves. They have no required reserves anymore. They have massive reserves due to QE, uh, one, two, three, and QE infinity now. Right. They have been told to forbear. They've been told that's why we gave you all these reserves by the regulators, the Fed and otherwise. Um, interest rates are very low. So as long as you have a positive NOI, you can service a new loan at 150 over the short term rate. As long as you basically, as long as you have positive NOI. So either they can forbear or they can make a new loan at a new interest rate that's so low that it, all you need is a positive NOI to carry it and you see where you're at in two years. And that could continue for easily another year or so. And the loans that are challenged and where you would then get transactions um, are securitized type of stuff, right. uh, CMBS, or things with negative operating income, right? Because I, it's one thing to say I'll forbear, or it's another thing to say I'll give you a new loan to replace the old loan at 150 over. Let's just call it 150 basis point interest rate. But if I've got negative NOI, I can't cover that. And 
So it's one thing for a lender to say, I'll forbear. It's another thing to say, I'll, I'll fund your negative operating losses. Right. And so there'll be need for fresh money there. Um, and then I think some of the private lenders, the non-bank lenders, uh, they don't have unlimited reserves, right? They don't have the Fed holding, you know, giving them the ability to hold on. So private lenders, when I say private, I just mean non-bank lenders, um, don't necessarily have the ability to forbear. And you will see some activity there. Uh, non-bank banks and so forth, although non-bank banks have gotten a fair amount of leeway because their primary source of capital are banks, and the banks are forbearing on them with kind of an understanding standing they forbear going forward. So I don't see – I see opportunities will always come up. I don't see massive opportunities that way. I will tell you, though, where I do see opportunity um, – mm-hmm. And we're going to we, – in the next Lineman letter, we, we have a – which won't be out until January, but we've been working on this piece, is multifamily today. And, uh, and, and by the way, multifamily, I think, is going to – it's doing okay, but unemployment is still high, and there's still issues. And, you know, yes, think about it. We now view it as good news that we only had 750,000 people last week file for an unemployment insurance. You know, that's, that's a good week. You know, (laughs) that it used to be a bad week was if we were over 300,000. And now we're saying it's a good week if it's down to 750,000 new people filing for unemployment. So it will stumble around and have challenges, especially in the urban areas. But Here's a very simple exercise, and we'll have the model minimum there, but you can do it. Which is, and the reason I picked multifamily is it's not lumpy, right? It's right. it's it's not like you lose one tenant, you could lose your whole income, or if you keep one tenant, you could keep your whole income. So I'm only taking multifamily in that sense. So imagine you buy at like a four, I don't know, a four and a half cap rate. Right. 4.7 cap rate. You can go out and borrow at about 2.8. Freddie and Fannie are still lending. So you can borrow. Uh, you do the math on that borrowing. You've got amazing coverage on current NOI, both of debt and interest. And then we did the following exercise. We said, what if income over the next 12 months falls by 10% and falls by another 8% the following year. So at the end of two years, you have an 18% drop in NOI. That's pretty dramatic, right? From today, right? That's from today. Well, what you'll find is you still have debt coverage of about 1.1 and interest coverage of about 1.9. So you're not going to lose your property even after an 18% drop in value. And even if it, not value and income, even if it fell further, you can cover the interest, in which case what they'll do is switch to a sweep loan, right, where they'll sweep all the proceeds. So you're not going to lose your building. And then you say, come on, the world's not going to come to an end. So for two years, I lose 18% of my income. But let's say at the end of year six, I've gotten it all back. So I go from an NOI of 10 today, I drop 18% and six years after the day I bought it, um, at the end of the sixth year, I'm back at the same income I started with, and it goes up a couple of percent a year after that. That turns out to be like a nine and a half IRR with a huge drop in income the day you buy it. Right. That's reasonably attractive. Your cash on cash is about the worst your cash on cash is, is like 2% in a world where 10 year treasury is what? 80 basis points, 70 basis points, and that's after the income dropped, and you kind of go, sign me up. So I think that's attractive. When you go to other property categories, similar math works, but the lumpiness of the investment makes it riskier. Namely, you could have an office property where the average goes down by 18% income over the two years, But that means one property didn't lose anything, right? They had Amazon 
on a 12-year lease or a law firm on a 12-year lease, they lose nothing. On the other hand, somebody lost 80% of their tenancy. So the average may have been 18%, but it was very skewed. And so it's a little different because of the lumpiness in other property categories, um, uh, though on a portfolio basis it works, but on an individual property. So I actually feel quite good about buying multifamily because the spread is so spectacular that even if income drops a lot, you won't lose your property and you'll do okay. And if it doesn't plunge in income, you'll really do okay. Right. You know, it's interesting, not unexpected, but still interesting to see. I had a couple of corporate training clients recently come back and say, all right, we want to do training this year. Training is still important, um, but we want to take a look at the curriculum. And the net of both of those conversations was, I don't want you to help them learn about office modeling. I want to fo focus instead on industrial. Uh -huh. And so... Not a surprise, but important um, to see what that means. And generally speaking, what do you think is the future of office? I mean, if big players. Oh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And in fact, I would just, I won't name the company, but major, major company. And look, they weren't that wrong. People are more productive at work than at home unless they're doing something highly creative like writing, right? I always found that I could write better at home yeah. than at the office because you don't get the interruption. But most things, you, people work better there. Most people are not disciplined enough. They're not highly scheduled enough. They don't have good enough facilities at home, too many distractions. Um, as you know, my brother Doug could easily work from home because we have been working remotely and but he has a hard time disciplining himself so he goes to the office every day even though he's generally the only one there Gensler just did a study I saw and what they found is most people want to go back to work now not necessarily five days a week but most people are anxious to go back but they want it to be safe before they go back and I think that this mythology of everybody's going to work from home, is, it's, it's, it is just that. There's a small group of people who can work effectively from home, like journalists, maybe like writers, um, but most people can't. Academics think they can, but that's because they don't want to interface with students. So the academic thinks they can work effectively from home. Their students don't feel that way. And I'm not joking. Um, and so, uh, and there's a customer side to all this, right? So I think once it's safe to get back to the office, once I don't have to worry about lawsuits if people get sick. And I remember, Bruce, I said, I think in April, do not assume that the government cares more about your employees and customers than you do. You care more about your customers and employees. And that's what we're seeing is that the employers care more about their customers and employees. They're not rushing them back. But when it is safe to be back, they're going to bring them back. And they're going to say, you want to work from home? That's fine, but not for me. Uh, when it's safe, they're going to say the same things they've always said. They might have a little more flexibility if you want to work from home on Tuesday. But in general, you're going to go because I need productivity. And I've said that you could have, you may be able to, to manage J.P. Morgan or Bloomberg or you know go uh, Microsoft. You may be able to manage it remotely. You could have never built it. Right. And 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 it's the building and growing that's going to bring them back. There's also the psychological. If no one is going to work, I'm missing no socialization by going in, and I'm missing nothing in terms of office politics. I don't mean Democrat, Republican. I mean who's getting the plum assignments and who's getting, you know, back back talked and backstabbed and so forth. Yeah. Now imagine a world where 65% of the employees are going in. Well, suddenly I need to be there. Right. 
even if I don't really want to be there, I need to be there to protect myself from the office politics or to take advantage of the office politics. And also, there's social. The problem now is if you go into the office and there's four people out of 400 in the office, there's no social. And by the way, you have to be distant from them and you can't even find them in the where they're at. And it's kind of spooky. So there's a tipping point, I think, out there. So I think office will do great. And if anything, I think office long term will benefit from this because those cool, hot seated, everybody work from wherever they want. Uh, you work elbow to elbow and put your little headphones on. That's yeah. gone. That's yeah. absolutely gone. And those are going to get retrofit out to what I would just call a more traditional office layout, cubicles and offices which is more footage per worker. And it's going to not only be for new leases going forward, it's going to be retrofitting back. And you say, well, nobody's retrofitting right now. Of course not. Who, who needs to retrofit if I've got 400 employees and five of them are coming in on a typical day? Right. I, I mean, 10 of them are coming in. It's when I start getting everybody back that I'm going to have to face that reality of retrofit and moving forward new leases. Right now, the only new leases are somebody's got a lease expiring. The landlord says, how about renewing? The tenant says, how about for one year? The landlord says, how about three years? The tenant says, how about one year? The landlord says, how about two years? The tenant generally says, how about one year? And the landlord says, that's what I meant all along. But no TIs, no leasing commissions, so it cash flows at least, right, during that year. Now, you may have a month of free rent you gave them on that year, but uh, there's not a lot of net new activity. We talked about multifamily, talked about offices, talked about industrial Let's talk about retail. For Let me just throw minute. one thing in on industrial, by the way, because, you know, as you, you were pointing out by your clients, everybody wants to focus on it. Right. And with good cause, right, because we know that modern uh, logistics for online sales take about three times the footage of the traditional uh, warehouse, right? So every – this is not quite accurate, but every sale – that occurs uh, online rather than traditional is an increase of threefold the amount of footage associated with that sale. Okay, so that's what's driving on that side, and that's great. However, I keep pointing out to people somebody owned the warehouses that were serving, and I'm going to take a very specific example the airports. Right. Somebody had warehouses that were serving all that stuff that was throughputting all these airports in, you know, a year ago. Right. When they were just machines of paper being consumed, sodas being consumed, food being consumed. You know, just go through all the stuff that an airport consumes. Right. Well, they're not consuming much right now. And a lot of those suppliers are struggling and going out of business. Somebody owns those warehouses and they're struggling, right? So it's not unmitigated uh, good news out there. Somebody owned the warehouses that served all those casinos and convention centers in Vegas that are now functioning or all the hotels that were servicing all and restaurants that were servicing all the tourists in New York and Washington and Philadelphia, those warehouses are struggling, right? That, so it's not unmitigated when you think about it. Yeah. And uh, they've got to survive somehow until that world comes back, which could take a couple of years. Th then you were then going to move on to another property category. I didn't mean to divert you. Well, but. well it is directly connected is, you know, brick retail. Uh, you were mentioning the connection the link there between online yeah and so i'm a believer in brick retail always have been a believer in good brick retail never been a believer in bad brick retail and there's two dimensions of bad the retailer is not exciting 
and is not providing good product, and they're not providing in a way that excites the imagination of customers. And bad retail always is challenged. And good retail has always found a way to thrive. And of course, what was good retail one day, five years later, may be bad retail because it goes out of fashion. It goes out of uh, style. You have retailers replaced by finance people who do a better job with the numbers, but not as good a job with the retailing. Um, You know, that's been the history of retail. So I've never been a fan of bad retail either in terms of retailers or the property, design, location, tenancy, et cetera. And the reason is the problem with bad retail locations are you can't lower your rent enough. This is a lesson I learned from Al Taubman many, many years ago. You can't lower your rent enough to change the price of Cheerios. Right. And if you can't change the price of Cheerios, you can't bring customers, right? The rent is just not a big enough component where you say, well, it's a bad location, but I can lower my rent and therefore attract. You can not attract because if they can't attract customers, they, you know, it, it's all about attracting customers. And I can't make my rent low enough that they can make their Cheerios half price. Right. And, and attract customers. So bad retail is always challenged. And I think what's happening is we're going through the kind of culling of bad retail that occurs every year throughout history. You're getting about two and a half years of culling occurring in a year or so. And that's good. It was going to occur anyway. Some of it was going to go online. Some of it was going to go to other retailers. Some of it was going to go to other shopping centers. And what people forget is the beauty of competition is the calling of the weak ones. And the weak ones, the, the weak, the sales of the weak shopping center, the sales of the weak retailer don't disappear they're going to go to stronger retailers and stronger retail centers. So in the short term, everybody is challenged by this economic downturn, the shutdown, people don't feel comfortable, can't go to the restaurant, don't feel like I can go to the restaurant. Everybody in retail is challenged by that, right? But in the longer term, the strong retailers and the strong retail locations are going to come out stronger because you're going to have eliminated about three years worth of weak retailers and weak retail centers, and they consolidate and make the remaining stronger. And that's the part people forget. The beauty of competition is I may end up with fewer, but the ones that survive are stronger. And so I'm not bullish on bad retail, never have been, but I am quite bullish on good retail. Will it be a lot of work the next? Yes, because of the butterfly economy effect. I don't know if they shut me down. Are they going to shut down the restaurants and the gyms? And I don't know. And even if they don't, do I feel comfortable? And will there be an outbreak? And so it's a rough period we're going through, but I feel good for good retail on the other side, both retailers and retail centers. Let's take a step back for a second. We're going to come out of this. It is a matter of time. Things are never going to move as fast as we want when we're coming out of the bottom. Uh, One of my former uh, mentors said, his former mentor, or one of his mentors said, a bell doesn't ring at the bottom and a bell doesn't ring at the top. So we know where we are now in hindsight. If we just take a step back and say, all right, if I were to be five years from today and I look back, what opportunities would I potentially have missed? Right. So if I, I, all, well, I think the one, today, right, the where one, should I yeah, the one I think people are, a lot of people are going to miss is the simple apartment description I gave, right? I think people are a bit terrified and haven't quote done the math and consider the risk, you know, the name of our book, right? Risk and opportunity. And they haven't really looked at the apartment side 
where you could take huge drops in income and still do okay. You know, right. that was, which is that's not such a bad thing to have a huge drop in income and do okay. Um, having said that, if you said, what other big opportunities? I, I actually have this view that right now the best thing is not to do much. Um, th- that means, you know, you may find particular unique opportunities, but there's a sense of, you know, it's like a knuckleball. I, you know, I think I told the last webinar about, you know, trying uh, Bob Mucker trying to catch Phil Necro's knuckleball, and he said he found it very easy. He just waited till the ball stopped rolling back at the backstop and picked it up. And I still think, you know, it's trying to catch a butterfly. Catching a butterfly is a very difficult thing, even though it's this delicate little animal, right? And I, I, I think for a lot of things, there just should be a bit more clarity. Having said that, I think we're past the bottom. We could go down. We could easily go down again, though. Not as far, but we could easily go down again because of what the government doesn't allow us to do and what we don't allow ourselves to do if the this is a bad December, January. So right. I don't think we're necessarily out, though I don't think we would go down as far. We've learned a lot, right? If you go back to March and April, we didn't know it wasn't very hard on young people. We do know that now. We know it's very hard on old and people with comorbidities. So I don't think it would go down as far, but it could go down. Um, uh, I think that one of the things five years from now we'll look back on is the same thing we could have looked back on in 2014 or 15 versus 2009. The Fed put enormous amounts of money into the system, into the banking system in particular. And at first it didn't come out, didn't come out in 2009. It kind of maintained some degree of liquidity. Remember, extend and pretend, right? If it was bank loans, if it was CMBS, it was different, but with bank loans, it was extend and pretend. And then what happened? People say, well, we didn't get inflation. We never got inflation from all that money that went in the system. That's not accurate. We didn't get consumer price inflation, but we got enormous asset price inflation from 2009 to 2019. Enormous. And that's because, by and large, the money chased assets rather than chewing gum and shoes, right? It chased, it chased companies, it chased real estate, it chased homes. And remember, when people say there'll be inflation because money goes in the system, they don't say specifically what it'll chase. And in the last time, all that money went in and most of it ended up chasing assets. And we had enormous asset price inflation over that decade, bonds, uh, stocks, real estate, homes, gold, silver, you know, we had enormous asset price inflation. And I think we're probably setting the stage for the same thing looking forward over the next decade. Tremendous amount of money has gone in, could be more still to go in. None of it's really coming out right now. But when it does, I think it's much more likely to chase assets than to chase goods and services. And what does that mean? It means uh, higher multiples, lower cap rates, just as we saw 2009 to 2019. And uh, I, I just have this feeling that we're in for a decade of asset price inflation starting a year and a half or so from now. And in fact, Bruce, if you think about On the consumer side, what were the two items where we had notable inflation in so-called consumer? And it was in healthcare and education, higher education, right? We had notable, they way outstripped inflation in real term. Those are both assets, though, if you think about it, right? They're human capital. So they actually had tremendous amount of money chasing assets, including human capital. So we saw an inflation of all, not all, but 
kind of all asset prices, including human capital chasing. And I think you could well get the same thing. And people will go look back and say, oh, I was frightened by cap rates being low. If I had to make a prediction, there's so much money out there. And we wrote about this in the last Lineman letter, and I wrote about this for the last five years. All my analysis shows that it's money chasing that drives cap rates. It's right. not in multiples of the stock market. It is not interest rates. It's money chasing. And if I told you there's going to be four times as much money chasing five years from now as today, you know the values will be up, which right. is to say income, uh, excuse me, cap rates will be down. And um, there's a lot of money out there, but it, so far it hasn't come out of the system. So I think people are missing that. They're, they assume that consumer price inflation is where it'll come out. And they say, we had no inflation the last decade. Look at what happened to gold prices. Look what happened to home prices. Look what happened, you know, right? Not, you can find exceptions, but generally assets went up. And that's why I say, including chasing the two key components of human capital, education and healthcare. So much to talk about, but uh, we're not going to be able to do it all. I do want to make everyone aware that uh, what we've discussed here is really just a taste of what's addressed on a regular basis in the Lineman letter, which is the quarterly publication from Lineman Associates. Uh, LinemanAssociates.com is the website, and for REFM, it's getrefm.com. Peter, thank you so much. As always, I remember about two webinars ago at this point, I said, Peter, how do you stay positive in the face of all this? And you said it beats the alternative. That's still true. That is still <laughs> absolutely true. We'll survive. In fact, I'll say two things to end on my part, Bruce. One is I was looking. This is our 20th anniversary issue of Lineman Letter coming up, 20th annual. Uh, anniversary. And I was just looking at the first issue just for yeah. fun. Yeah. And then it occurred to me since then we had a dot com crash. We had 9 11. We had um, uh, we had the financial crisis, not to mention endless number of terrible hurricanes and floods and fires. We have now had COVID. We've had endless numbers of uh, political and politician mishaps over that that 20 years. Um, uh, we've had you know, you, you kind of you you know we had SARS. We had you name it, and right. the world didn't come to an end. And yeah. yet, at each moment, there were people saying the world's coming to an end. And if Lineman Letter did one thing consistently over those 20 years. It said the world doesn't come to an end. It just doesn't come to an end, even when it's feeling like it. And to your point, it beats the alternative. And if the world's coming to an end, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. So that would be one thing I'd say. And then the other is we probably won't have a chance to speak to the listeners uh, until the other side of the holidays, although I, I might record something next month and we'll post it on our site. You can stay in touch with Doug uh, on that. But um, uh, happy holidays to all. Stay safe. Stay smart. Uh, don't die in the last year of the war needlessly. Um, and um, as you get ready to go through not just the holiday seasons, but all of this, Some ma many of you know I have an education charity that – helps the number of children here, but also in, in uh, uh, destitute children in Kenya. All I would say is do good uh, during the next few months. However difficult it is for you, there are people out there who have it even more difficult. And it, it lend an emotional helping hand, lend a kind word, lend a dollar if you can. Uh, there's no shortage of good causes and people struggling. Be alert to people during this winter with uh, depression issues that you know and care about these people and try to help and, and get them to resources as they need them. 
but uh, happy holiday and stay safe. And Bruce, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll see folks uh, in earnest again in 2021. Maybe we'll have flying cars next year. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> okay. Happy holidays. Take care. Thank you.